This is section 9 of The Mutiny of the Bounty, abridged from William Bly's narrative, and other narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter 5, Falls into English Hands, read by John Greenman. Having finished our preparations, we left Angola for Boston. We reached the Island of Ascension in safety, where was a post-office of a truly patriarchal character. A box is nailed to a post near the shore. Ships that pass send to the box and deposit or take out letters, as the case may be. This is probably the cheapest general post-office establishment in the world. We had scarcely left this island before the cry of, "'Sail ho!' arrested every ear. Supposing her to be a large merchantman, we made towards her. But a nearer approach made it doubtful whether she was an Indian man or a man of war. The captain judged her to be the latter and tacked ship immediately. He was unwilling to place himself in the situation of an American privateer, who, mistaking a seventy-four for a merchantman, ran his ship close alongside and boldly summoned her to haul down her colors. The captain of the other ship coolly replied, "'I am not in the habit of striking my colors.' At the same moment the ports of his ship were opened and disclosed her long ranges of guns yawning over the decks of the privateer. Perceiving his mistake, the privateer, with admirable tact and good humor, said, "'Well, if you won't, I will,' and pulling down his bunting, surrendered to his more powerful foe. To avoid such a mistake as this, our captain made all sail to escape the coming stranger, which was now bearing down upon us under a heavy pressure of canvas, revealing, as she gained upon our little brig, that she bore the formidable character of a seventy-four-gun ship under English colors. Of course, fighting was out of the question. It would be like the assault of a dog on an elephant, or a dolphin on a whale. We therefore crowded all possible sail, threw our guns, cables, anchors, hatches, etc., overboard, to increase her speed, but it soon became apparent that we could not escape. The wind blew quite fresh, which gave our opponent the advantage. She gained on us very fast. We shifted our course in hopes to baffle her until the night, when we felt pretty sure of getting out of her way. It was of no use she still gained, until we saw ourselves almost within gunshot of our opponent. In this extremity the captain ordered the quartermaster, George Watson, to throw the private signals overboard. This was a hard task for the bold-hearted fellow. As he pitched them into the sea, he said, "'Good-bye, brother Yankee,' an expression which, in spite of their mortifying situation, forced a smile from the lips of the officers. The sound of a gun now came booming through the air. It was a signal for us to heave to, or to look out for consequences." What might have been, we learned afterwards, for a division of the crew of the seventy-four had orders to sink us if we made the least show of resistance. Finding it useless to prolong the chase, our commander reluctantly ordered the flag to be struck. We then hove to, and our foe came rolling down upon us, looking like a huge avalanche rushing down the mountainside to crush some poor peasant's dwelling. Her officers stood on her quarter-deck, glancing unutterable pride, while her captain shouted, "'What brig is that?' "'The United States Brig Siren,' replied Captain Nicholson. "'This is His Britannic Majesty's ship Medway,' he answered. "'I claim you as my lawful prize.' Boats were then lowered, the little brig taken from us, and our crew transferred to the Medway stowed away in the cable-tier, and put in messes of twelve, with an allowance of only eight men's rations to a mess, a regulation which caused us considerable suffering from hunger. The sight of the marines on board the Medway made me tremble, for my fancy pointed out several of them as having formerly belonged to the Macedonian. I really feared I was destined speedily to swing at the yard-arm. It was, however, a groundless alarm." This event happened July 12, 1814. Only eight days before we had celebrated the independence of the United States. Now we had a fair prospect of a rigorous imprisonment. 
such are the changes which constantly occur under the rule of the war spirit the day subsequent to our capture we were marched to the quarter-deck with our clothes bags where we underwent a strict search we were ordered to remove our outside garments for this purpose they expected to find us in possession of large quantities of gold dust what little our crew had purchased was taken from them with a spirit of rapacity altogether beneath the dignity of a naval commander our short allowance was a source of much discomfort in this our prison ship but in the true spirit of sailors we made even this the subject of coarse jests and pleasant remark enduring this evil we proceeded on our course when the medway arrived at simon's town about twenty-one miles from the cape of good hope we met the denmark seventy-four on her way to england with prisoners from cape town the captain had hitherto intended to land us at the latter place but the presence of the denmark led him to change his purpose and land us at simon's town the journey from this place to the cape was one of great suffering to our crew we were received on the beach by a file of irish soldiers under their escort we proceeded seven miles through heaps of burning sand seeing nothing worthy of notice on the way but a number of men busily engaged in cutting up dead whales on the seashore after resting a short time we recommenced our march guarded by a new detachment of soldiers unused to walking as we were we began to grow excessively fatigued and after wading a stream of considerable depth we were so overcome that it seemed impossible to proceed any farther we lay down discouraged and wretched on the sand the guard brought us some bread and gave a half pint of wine to each man this revived us somewhat we were now placed under a guard of dragoons they were very kind and urged us to attempt the remaining seven miles to relieve us they carried our clothes bags on their horses and overtaking some dutch farmers going to the cape with broom stuff and brush the officer of the dragoons made them carry the most weary among us in their wagons it is not common for men to desire the inside of a prison but i can assure my readers we did most heartily wish ourselves there on that tedious journey at last about nine o'clock p m we arrived at cape town having left one of our number at weinberg through exhaustion who joined us the next day stiff sore and weary we hastily threw ourselves on the hard boards of our prison where without needing to be soothed or rocked we slept profoundly until late the next morning when we took a survey of our new quarters we found ourselves placed in a large yard surrounded by high walls and strongly guarded by soldiers within this enclosure there was a building or shed composed of three rooms neither of which had any floor round the sides stood three benches or stages one above the other to serve for berths on these we spread our hammocks and bedclothes making them tolerably comfortable places to sleep in a few of the men preferred to sling their hammocks as they did at sea here also we used to eat unless as was our frequent practice we did so in the open air we remained in prison at the cape till carried away in the ship cumberland to england stopping by the way at st helena we were removed to the grampus a transfer which greatly alarmed me since the more men who saw me the greater of course was my chance of detection luckily no one knew me and i arrived with my companions in safety at plymouth i was equally fortunate here and remained undiscovered till i was transferred with others to a vessel which was to take us in exchange to america i pass over the circumstances of the voyage and only mention that we were all landed in due time at new york my resolution had been to quit the sea and settle down on land but on returning to new york all such fancies vanished as they had done before i spent my hard-won earnings foolishly like others and like them when reduced to straits again sought employment as a sailor on this occasion i shipped on board the boxer commanded by captain porter a man as it proved of stern disposition the boxer was a brig sloop had as i understand been captured from the english a short time previously and in a manner which i may describe as illustrative of naval warfare 
The encounter took place at no great distance from Portland in the United States, on the 5th of September, 1813. The boxer, possessing twelve eighteen-pound carronades and two sixes, was commanded by Captain Blythe, and his antagonist, the American brig sloop Enterprise, commanded by Captain Burroughs, was armed with fourteen eighteen-pound carronades and two nines. Captain Blythe is spoken of as having been one of the bravest officers in the British service, and it is said that, prompted by the ardor of his temperament, he would encounter any foe, however great were the odds against him. In the beginning of August, 1811, when acting as first lieutenant of the Quebec, cruising between the Texel and Elbe, he volunteered with a small select party to cut out some French gunboats, and by the most daring intrepidity his enterprise was successful. For this gallant action he was promoted to the command of the boxer, which was by no means suited to his impetuous character. The boxer was one of a set of brigs which had been respectively named after favorite hounds of one of the lords of the admiralty, and built, as was afterwards discovered, on an improper model, whether as respects strength of timber or sailing powers. Eager to meet an enemy's ship, Captain Blythe, while lying off Portland, observed the enterprise approaching on the horizon, and immediately bore up to engage, leaving on shore the surgeon and two midshipmen who were away shooting pigeons. After maneuvering a few hours on various tacks to try rates of sailing, the two vessels, at a quarter past three in the afternoon, commenced firing at the distance of half pistol shot apart. In the very first broadside, an eighteen-pound shot passed through Captain Blythe's body and shattered his left arm, causing instant death. And about the same moment, a musket ball fired from the boxer mortally wounded Captain Burroughs. The command of the boxer now devolved upon her only Lieutenant David McCreary, and that of the Enterprise on Lieutenant Edward McCall. At half-past three the Enterprise ranged ahead, and rounding to on the starboard tack, raked the boxer with starboard guns, and shot away her main top mast and fore topsail yard. The American then set her foresail, and, taking a position on the starboard bow of her now wholly unmanageable antagonist, continued pouring in successive raking fires until forty-five minutes past three, when the boxer surrendered. This defeat was caused not only by the damages done to the vessel, but by the weakened condition of the boxer's crew. The lieutenant commander, owing to the imprudent absence of the two midshipmen, had not an officer beneath him, and the master's mate and three seamen deserted their quarters during the action. Besides her commander, the boxer had three men killed and seventeen wounded, while the Enterprise, besides her commander, had three or four killed and eleven wounded. The prize was carried into Portland, and there, on the 7th of September, the bodies of the two commanders were buried with military and civic honors. Refitted for the American service, the boxer was now ready for a cruise, and I prepared to do my duty on board as an ordinary seaman. Formerly I had been entered only as a boy, but now, as a rated seaman, I had a station assigned me in the foretop, instead of being a servant to any of the officers. I was also appointed to be one of the crew of the captain's gig. This made my lot one of more fatigue and exposure than in any former voyage, a proof of which I very soon experienced. It being now late in the fall, the weather became very cold. One afternoon, the pennant having got foul of the royal mast, an officer ordered me to go up and clear it. I had no mittens on, and it took me some time to perform my task, and before I came down one of my fingers was frozen. Thus it is, however, with the poor tar, and he thinks himself happy to escape with injuries so slight as this. We shortly received sailing orders, and were soon under way, bound to the Belize in the Gulf of Mexico. Here we cruised about some time, visiting New Orleans and other places, and keeping an outlook for pirates, with which these seas were then unhappily infested. This was a duty requiring great vigilance, and we were kept constantly at our posts. The most irksome duty of a sailor is to keep watch at night in the tops. 
often i have stood for hours on the royal yard or topgallant yard without a man to converse with here overcome with fatigue and want of sleep i have fallen into a dreamy dozing state from which i was roused by a lee lurch of the ship starting up i have shuddered at the danger i had so narrowly escaped but notwithstanding this sudden fright a few minutes had scarcely elapsed before i would be nodding again this of course was a highly punishable offence when the weather was rough we were indulged with permission to stand on the foretop sail yard or on the topgallant cross trees and if the ship rolled heavily we lashed ourselves to the mast for safety i can assure my readers there is nothing desirable in this part of a sailor's duty in whatever the pleasure of a life at sea consists it is not in keeping a lookout from the masthead at night but the most disagreeable of all is to be compelled to stand on these crazy elevations when half dead with seasickness some suppose that sailors are never seasick after the first time they go to sea this is a mistake it is very much with them as with landsmen in respect to being sick in a coach those who are of bilious temperament are always affected more or less when they ride in a coach or sleigh while others are never sick on these occasions so with seamen some are never seasick others are sick only when going out of port while some are so in every gale of wind it is almost needless to say that for sailors no allowance is made for seasickness they must in all cases remain at their posts until it is time to be relieved End of chapter 5